the Jericho Network on Westwood One. Welcome to Talk is Jericho. This is the Pot of Thunder and Rock and Roll. Uh, the remedy for boredom has arrived, and it is Friday with a uh, little bit of a different turn of events on this uh, this uh, this uh, show today. Um, if you uh, listen to the Station Fire tragedy show with uh, Mike Riccardi that we had on a couple months ago, this was recorded on the same day as that. Very, very heavy subject, especially for me because I was very close to it. Uh, today is the nine-year anniversary of the death of Chris Benoit and uh, the tragedy of, of the Benoit family, the, the loss of Nancy Benoit and their son, uh, Daniel Benoit. Uh, I had done an interview with Bill Apter a few months ago, a year ago, whatever it was, where he had a certain theory on uh, on Chris's uh, death and the whole uh, f- facts and figures and the events that took place on that weekend. A little bit more of a fantastic, I think there was a conspiracy idea that he had or something on those lines. After that happened, uh, Sandra Tofaloni um, contacted me. Now, Sandra is Nancy Benoit's sister. They grew up together. Uh, she was there for Nancy when she was married to Kevin Sullivan and then throughout the whole um, duration of the relationship of, of Chris and Nancy, aunt to Daniel, nanny uh, of the family as well. And she contacted me and said for the first time ever, she wanted to uh, do a full in-depth interview on her, um, I guess, her thoughts and her side and her uh, experiences with the whole situation of what happened nine years ago in 2007, June 24th, 2007. Um, So she contacted me and we met up in Orlando. She lives in Florida, Southern Florida. I live over in Tampa, as you guys know. We met up in Orlando the weekend of the Royal Rumble to have this conversation. And I wanted to wait until this weekend to, to air the show. Very poignant and very timely. Uh, so she is going to talk for the first time ever in depth about her sister and nephew's murder and what may have caused her brother-in-law, Chris Benoit, to, to kill his family and then take his own life. Now, everyone knows that, that Chris uh, was one of my closest friends, uh, not so much at the time of, of all this, but for years, probably from 1994 to 2004 or five, he was uh, my number one guy, him and Eddie Guerrero. So uh, very close to the situation and still haven't really come to complete terms with it to this day as um, I'm sure many people haven't fans and friends and and family alike, but that's why it was so great to talk to to Sandy and and get um, her perspective on all this thing, because she was very close with Chris as well. And she's going to share some of her good memories about her brother-in-law in in addition to amazing heartfelt thoughts and stories about her sister and her nephew. It's funny because I read some, some jackasses online saying, Oh, she, I hope this isn't going to be a whole burial of Chris Benoit, a whole whole bashing of Chris Benoit for an hour. Of course it's not, but it's very, uh, it's, this is the very true story of what happened uh, before, during and after Chris was a great guy, tremendous guy. Something happened in the last weekend of his life, but it wasn't just the last weekend. It was months and months before, which Sandra is going to tell us about. She's going to speak very candidly about, what it was like in the minutes, uh, hours, days right after they found out that, that Nancy and Daniel and died had died and, and how they died. Uh, she's talking about staying in the house right after it happened, dealing with press and with all the, the fans and how she's doing today. So it's a heavy show, but it's a, it's a one that I really felt driven to do, and I really wanted to do this. And I'm really glad I did, and I hope you guys uh, get a little closure out of this as well. Inside look at the Benoit family tragedy with Nancy Benoit's sister, Sandra Tofaloni, and myself. And we'll get to Sandy. Right after we talk about another unbelievable story, but this one had a happy ending, although it could have very much ended in tragedy as well. Uh, this story will leave you feeling inspired and wanting to change your life for the better as well. Talk about the documentary, The Resurrection of Jake the Snake, which just came out on, on Blu-ray and DVD. I can't say enough about this documentary. Not a wrestling documentary. It's just a, a story of one man's battle back from near death to reclaim his life, family, and career. And he just happened to be in the pro wrestling business. But even if you saw this documentary when it came in, out in the theaters or if you saw it... Um, 
any other way. You're still going to want the collector's edition DVD of this movie because of the extras that Diamond Dallas Page and his team meticulously loaded onto this DVD. They're very, very uh, uh, fine tooth comb with all the stuff they put on there. 20 bonus features, including a commentary track narrated by DDP himself, Jake the Snake, and director Steve Yu. And right now, if you go to ddpyoga.com slash Jericho, you can get this must-see documentary. You can get 10% off the collector's edition Blu-ray or DVD or anything else you order off of ddpyoga.com for a limited time. You all know what DDP Yoga has done for me. It saved my wrestling career, it saved my music career, it saved my quality of life, and you can see what it did for Jake the Snake uh, when you get this documentary. Diamond Dallas Page and DDP Yoga literally saved Jake the Snake's life. So get yourself a copy at ddpyoga.com slash Jericho. You will be inspired, and then give DDP Yoga and the DDP Yoga Now app a try yourself. I'm telling you. This is the real deal. If, you, if, you, if you're becoming uh, deaf to this because I talk about DDP yoga every week, don't. If you're overweight, if you're having issues with your soreness, uh, I was having some major elbow and shoulder problems over the last week after two street fights in Salt Lake City and Los Angeles and then the Money in the Bank ladder match, which just kicked my ass. When Cesaro swung me through uh, with a giant swing into that ladder, I was protecting my head with my hand, and that hand got squished right in the ladder. Couldn't bend it for days uh, and the shoulder attached to it. But D DDP Yoga has helped me loosen up. It's helping me to uh, feel better. So go to ddpyoga.com slash Jericho. D- get 10% off anything you purchase for a limited time, including the uh, Jake the Snake Roberts DVD and the DDP Yoga program yourself. ddpyoga.com slash Jericho. Go give it a try, man. Get off your ass. It's time to do it, all right? Get a better quality of life and make it happen now. All right, you know what else I made happen? It's coming on March 15th, 2017. It's the biggest podcast ever. Jericho versus Foley. That's right. Jericho and Mick Foley together on Talk is Jericho for the first time ever. March 15th, 2017. 263 days and counting until the biggest podcast ever. Okay, so um, it was a couple months ago I had uh, Bill Apter on the show. And he was talking about um, his theories on, on, on the Chris Benoit tragedy. And then you reached out to me, Sandy, Sandy Toffoloni, who is Nancy's sister. And um, I'm not even really too sure how it came about. Did you just text me? Did you have my number? Or? I did. I did just text you. Yeah, I have... Um, I have everybody's yeah. number, right, right, <laughs> of right, course, right. Yeah. Um, from kind of growing up a little bit one step away from the business. So uh-huh. um, I had reached out to Paul Heyman, who I had asked about, who's Bill Aptor and what is this about? Uh, and yeah. he's like, oh, you know, why don't you just talk to Chris about it? And he said, do you have his information? Mm-hmm. And I said, actually, I do. I really yeah, do. Yeah, yeah. And so I just texted you and said, hey that's the craziest thing that I've ever heard. And I want to talk to you about it. So. Yeah. And, and we'll kind of get into that, but you have mentioned this before we got on the air talking about Paul Heyman and you and him are, are seem like you're pretty good friends. We're, we're very close. He's been, um, a constant source of calm, mm-hmm. surprisingly mm-hmm. <laughs> in my life since, uh, everything happened. And, um, my sister told me many, many years ago that, uh, if there was anyone to trust in the business or anyone to talk to about things other than the business, the person to always trust is Paul. Mm-hmm. And I took that as gospel law when she says something like that, cause she doesn't say things like that lightly. Right. So, uh, he was the first person in the business that I contacted after everything had happened. Mm-hmm. And, um, when we talk on the phone, he's, he always laughs cause he said, it's just, it's like talking to your sister. You sound yeah. just like her. You laugh just like her. It's like, it's, well, it's very comforting. I to him said too. too, like you have the same cheekbones and you can yeah. see a lot of similarities there. And actually yeah. the first time I ever met Nancy was at an ECW show. Her, <laughs> my first one, I think was her last one before yeah. she went to WCW. Mm-hmm. But I remember like she, like told some jokes just very friendly fun person to yeah. to to be around and she was your older sister older sister right? we're exactly 10 years apart okay oh really 10 yeah. years apart now did you have any apart. other brothers or sisters no it's just the two of us okay yep so she was probably someone you looked up to your whole life yeah. very much so very much so we're we're both 17 born on the 17th she's may and i'm october mm-hmm. and she and i are 10 years apart and then our parents are also we all turn the same age every year. You know, like when one of us turns 31, she turns 41, my right. mom and dad turns 61. Okay. So it's like that. Yeah, a little bit of family. So, kismet. yeah, um, she was the biggest influence in my life. You know, mm. she's more 
like a mom kind of than a sister until I got a little older then we could kind of cause trouble together <laughs> then it was more like a sister and a best and she friend. was already in the wrestling business at that point right she was she's been in since she was about 15 um her, really? 15 yeah really did you not know? I yeah. didn't know that yeah um her very first this was a long time ago Florida championship wrestling days and um her first I think her first time out to the ring was with Black Jack Mulligan and she um, she went out there in a bathing suit with her hair all curled and whatever at um, almost almost 16 and just um, at a place here in town in Orlando called Eddie Graham Sports Stadium which is an, an old old wrestling haunt yeah, that yeah, a lot yeah. of people will respond to and uh, she just fell in love with it from mm. there I mean from that very moment fell in love with it and then Ended up meeting Kevin uh -huh. a little while after that. So. so, did you grow up as a wrestling fan then? As a result, no. Okay, I have not, and I am so ashamed. It's not ashamed to say that, but um, I never had any kind of affinity for the business, except that I enjoyed the people in it, um, meeting everyone outside of their persona and outside of work. Mm -hmm. I had some. Sadly, most of them are not with us anymore. But I had some very fond memories of some wonderful people that um, were around through my formative years, mm -hmm. like like my ex-brother-in-law, like Kevin Sullivan and Mark Lewin, uh, who's the Purple Haze years and years ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm showing my age, but, <laughs> and um, then after that, it was Rocco and Johnny Grunge, which that was Both Mike Durham, yeah. you know, and Mike Durham actually was my sister and Chris's neighbor in Peachtree City for years. And my sister and Chris were um, godparents to his son, right. Mikey. And uh, Mike and I hit it off gangbusters. We were serious troublemakers. We, <laughs> we caused a lot of damage in Peachtree City and, <laughs> and a lot of damage in Daytona. Whenever he disappeared, Kevin would call me and send me out around Daytona to bars and stuff to find him. <laughs> so we had some good times. So I enjoyed being around the business that way. But as far as... Um, you know, sitting sitting through matches and mm -hmm. stuff like that. It really wasn't. Yeah, you my... enjoyed the the camaraderie part of it. I did, which I is did. a big part of the business. Yeah, yeah. Yep, and it, it's a bigger part of it than you would imagine that it is. Mm -hmm. You know, going like production meetings and stuff like that. Like I saw through Kevin and especially with Chris how you know the the more the Behind. more tame side of everything, yeah. you know, the kind of snooze, snoozer <laughs> side of it. Like, oh my God, another meeting. <laughs> what did you think uh, of it when Nancy kind of became an, uh, a national and an international star in the it business? Was, uh, I still thought of her as my, you know, naggy older sister a little <laughs> bit, you know, but um, back in the WCW days when um, Nitro was on and it was like she was on TV every single week, sometimes twice a week, it was... I think I was in um, the end of junior high going into high school, so a lot of people were like, you know, oh, can you get us wrestling tickets? Your sister's on TV. And I was like, really? People want to see her? Or, um, you know, I'm someone because, quote, mm -hmm. quote, my sister's someone? And I was like, wow. But I was just very proud of her because she, you know, stayed true to herself and was happy and content in what she was doing. And she also brought a lot of women along into the business, which up until then really wasn't that is true thing. she yeah. was one of the very very first valets in the business that parlayed itself into now mm -hmm. what we know in the modern wrestling world is you know the divas divas right right so um yeah she and liz and luna and they were the very first that, that's true i mean because i mean and nancy never wrestled she was always like you said a valet mm -hmm. you know she was uh standing you know the, the race side and being involved in that respect which is kind of a a lost art in this day and age but to be able to do that and be a part of the show in such a big way mm -hmm. and it is and she she turned that into i guess with her we're both kind of big personalities we get that a lot from our parents mm -hmm. but um she turned that into being a manager and when she went you know she started managing acts like doom and public enemy and mm -hmm. things like that um she parlayed that into an actual managing career and i think that that's important as well because it turned into oh she's a beautiful girl and she's great to look at out in the ring but you know her persona obviously through a lot of that was being mean and being evil yeah and being, you know that right. was her she was a heel obviously yeah. for a very long time and um 
and she turned that into the greatest thing ever. I mean, she really. <laughs> she, was, she was really good at it. I, I just really love the name. It. Her name was Woman. Like, it's just yep. like Woman. Just, that's it. <laughs> that's it. And she went from Fallen Angel, and mm-hmm. then she did this uh, stick, like this stick in the middle there where she um, dressed up as a nerd. I think it was with the Steiner brothers. Oh, yeah. Right. She dressed up as a nerd in the audience. I just want to say for the record, that was my idea because I'm the nerd of the family. I was like, what if you were a total geek, like marking out in the audience and then, you know, oh, it's really you. when you, she's like, That's kind of how she came into WCW, right? Right. Yeah. That is exactly. Yeah. She was Robin Green. Oh. <laughs> and then that was what, how she into, got into the, the WCW world. Right. And turned into woman you know, oh. after that. So, um, that was, you know, that was a huge deal. Mm-hmm. So, and and bringing Paul up again, he was a huge part of that. Yeah, he was there her. at that point yeah, in time. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. How long was was Nancy married to Kevin Sullivan for? Um, they were together for uh, almost a decade. Okay. And um, they were they were married for a shorter time than that, but they were together for almost a decade, living together and working together. So yeah. I think it was only about four or five years, if I'm not mistaken. So, um, and then it was. You know, she was head of Kevin and went right with Chris. Mm-hmm. He had, you know, that was a whole. <laughs> when did you start hearing about Chris from her? Did she was she ever mention his name at all, or just from working mm-hmm. a little bit? And then uh, they had a, a fateful trip to to Japan. And when she came home, things had in her personal life had turned a little differently. And uh, she had sort of kept me out of the loop a little bit about what had happened. She didn't want me to know the details of it. Just she didn't want me to be upset, mm-hmm. and I didn't know about it. And right coming right out of the Japan trip was Bash at the Beach in Daytona, and that was my first actual physical meeting with Chris. Ironically, mm-hmm. was backstage at Bash at the Beach, and I had been sitting with Kevin's kids in the family section of that match, and I didn't know what was going so wrong during the match. I, you know, mm-hmm. as someone who has sat in the family section through many a match, admittedly reading a book, but whatever, mm-hmm. <laughs> I was there, kind of paying attention yeah. a little bit. You know, I used to get glares from <laughs> from the fans. From the fans, what is she doing? Yeah. Um, but I, I could tell something wasn't right with the match, and then so um, was it a match with Sullivan versus it Benoit? Was with, it was with Chris and Kevin. It was the a retirement match. So you could tell something wasn't wasn't going right what, in one way. It was it was very. You know, it wasn't just what's usually choreographed and gone through. Everyone knows you can seriously get injured during wrestling. Sure, sure, sure. You know, the worst things can happen. And I saw Kevin sort of lose his balance after a hit from Chris to the head. And Uh, I didn't know what was going on. And he had boxed Kevin's ear. And so um, they were really fighting. They were they were going at it Mm -hmm. hard. And then cameras cut off, and they went back into the dressing rooms. And then um, Rick came out. Rick Flair had come out. Uh, for just a moment and put his hand in the air and waved Mm. at myself and and Kevin's daughter to get up and we walked back there and and they were fighting in the hallway. Wow. Yeah. But someone was standing between them Mm -hmm. and uh, and Kevin said, come on, we're leaving. He motioned to me and I started to walk toward him and Chris Chris stepped toward me and grabbed my arm and he said, your sister wants you to come with me. Mm -hmm. And I said, I don't know I didn't know him yeah, at you, all. You know, I'm like, um, I'm going with my brother-in-law. What are you crazy? Yeah, you know? yeah, like, yeah, yeah. He's like, no. He's like, I'll call her right now. And he did. He called my sister right then and there. And I got on the phone with her. She's like, I want you to leave with Chris right now. Get out of there. And that was my first, my first introduction Me. to Chris. Was a re- weird, awkward <laughs> yeah. situation. But he was very calm and and you know kind to me when I was like what is going on like just mm-hmm. freaking out about it and then once i got home with my sister and got the whole rest of the story i i understood a little bit more so. it was a it was a um a strange situation because the storyline that was going on on tv was that sullivan and nancy were together and then she turned on sullivan and went with chris benoit or something along those lines but in real life that's kind of what, that led to actually really happening right it did it led to it happening um and it said it's been said over and over in the business and behind the scenes and right up front, I guess that you know Kevin Sullivan produced and wrote his own divorce, mm. and you know and he's great at what he does, so yeah, it yeah. really came it came through. But it, it was so much more than that. I mean, Nancy and Chris really just fell in love, madly in love, and um, 
they they were both in weird different situations when it happened and you know nothing mattered though mm. than them wanting to be together and start a life and a family together so, right yeah because they both had they were both married at the time they were they yeah. were both, at, yeah at the beginning they were both married at the mm -hmm. time yeah what was so. your um uh, first impressions of chris besides the weird <laughs> yeah, yeah besides the weird introduction yeah. um he was very quiet mm. as we all know and my family were irish and italian so we we're very loud and very mm. you know we voice everything and and um I crack jokes almost constantly. I kind of don't know what else to do. I'm not cracking a joke, so <laughs> sort of my default mode. <laughs> and um, he was, he's very reserved, as you know, from Edmonton. And uh, sarcasm, one of my go to in my bag of tricks, sarcasm doesn't translate sometimes too well, <laughs> Canadians, because they're so nice. And they don't really get when you're like, yeah. you know, say something yeah. sarcastic. Oh, she's really funny. And if you say really like that, Chris would be like, oh, is she? I'm like, no, no, dude. <laughs> like, right, look right. at my face. Get the inflection. Yeah, 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 catch yeah, yeah. It. And then he would laugh. Then he, after about six months of knowing each other, he just constantly laughed at everything that I said. So um, he was kind and, and considerate, very quiet, very focused, mm -hmm. and just a driven guy. Right. Um, but, you know, caring. I mean, mm -hmm. he, he, he loved my sister. He wanted to be around myself, my parents, a lot, you know, so um, it was kind of a stark contrast from relationships that she had had in the past where, you know, as a family, we weren't too involved in a relationship. But up there, uh, when she moved to the Atlanta area with Chris, you know, we were constantly open door policy, come whenever you want, which, as you know, in this business is almost unheard of to yeah, just be like, sure. yeah, come over whenever, because someone's always, there's always a house show, there's always a match, a flight, a this, a that, so, you know, Everyone's mm. very busy, but with him, it was, yeah. it was just like, show up, just be there, you know. So. You mentioned, uh, it, 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 you know, Chris and, and like, oh, is she really funny? Like, his, he had a very weird sense of humor, but he had a sense of humor. But I remember, like, there's this tape that I heard in Canada. It's, it's like a, a joke radio station. It's called Brocket 99. Mm -hmm. And it went around, like, to <laughs> everywhere. Like, it's kind of an underground thing. And it's... Everyone that would hear it would just be laughing at how like funny it is. And I played it for him one night. We were driving somewhere, and he never laughed once. And I started thinking, like, is this just not funny anymore? Like, right. it, it, do I have a bad sense of humor? And he's like, he's like, no, it's really funny. I'm like, you're not even laughing. He goes, oh, I'm laughing inside, you know. And it's like you're don't. It's just a weird, you know. That was him. And then yeah. and then you know somebody would you know puke all over themselves and he'd be laughing hysterically like it was yeah. the funniest thing in the world ever yeah you that's, know that's just kind of the strangeness of that guy you yeah, know he did it was it's not that straightforward like you know have like an observational humor and if i i would say something or we'd be out to eat or say something or like kick him on the table and be like check this out you know and say something a little funny and he'd be like and he'd more examine Straight it. Faced, yeah. yeah, he'd yeah, yeah, examine yeah. it more than be like, oh, and roll his eyes and laugh with me. And so it took me a long time to, it took me a long time to get in there. Uh -huh, you know, they uh -huh. used to always tell my sister, That's what good is point. his deal? You know, what's the story? Like, I'm using my best material. I'm like, <laughs> I'm dying up there. You know, is this thing on? Yeah. Kind of thing. And she's like, oh, that's just him. She's mm. like, you'll get there, you'll get there. And I think it was more of just him really, of us spending more time together and getting mm -hmm. to know one another. That it was like, oh, okay, now I see why she's funny. And then, and after that, it was like floodgates open. Mm -hmm. We would just start, we would crack each other up constantly in the kitchen, usually at the expense of someone else in the family, like <laughs> being funny. But what was really funny is when Daniel got to the age of where he'd start mimicking, you know, he would start, he would hear Chris and I in the kitchen laughing and he'd sit on the couch and he'd make fun of us laughing. He'd be like, ah, oh, ha, ha, like in a sarcastic <laughs> laugh. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that is my nephew for sure. He's <laughs> making fun of us laughing. <laughs> it's like, he is, he is, he does that all the time. Yeah, I mean, Daniel was Chris and Nancy's son and I mean, Nancy had never had a, a child with Kevin Sullivan. So, how was that when she was pregnant? And was it? You must have been pretty excited. It was the greatest thing ever. Yeah, <laughs> it was the greatest thing ever. Um, she was thrilled, happy. He was thrilled, happy. We all were. I mean, it's you know, he was my only nephew and the only grandchild my my parents had. So, um, we were just very, very thrilled, very mm -hmm. excited, mm -hmm. and couldn't wait. Right, I just couldn't wait to meet him. So. 
She had a lot of filet of fish from McDonald's. <laughs> she used to call me on the phone and be like, I'm having my third filet of fish today. I'm like, you've got to stop that. <laughs> like, you know that's not fish, I'm right? Pregnant. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, yeah, it's, it's cooked cardboard. Yeah, it with mortified, a lot of yeah. It mortified Christopher. Oh, he must have hated that. Oh, God, it made him crazy. I'll go get you fish. I'll go get you sandwich. She's like, I don't want that, yeah. man. I want this. <laughs> <laughs> we used to travel, me and Dean and Eddie and Chris. And... Um, Eddie and Chris were always looking at the back of, of like products, like you know how much fat is in it, how much sugar, how much grams of whatever. Yep. And I remember me and Dean would like do it because well that's what they were doing. One time we just looked each other in the face, we're like laughing, like, we're never, we don't care how much fat is in like you know this bag of almonds. But that was Chris and Eddie to an extent too, but very strict on every single thing that they ate and did and training. They get up at seven in the morning to train on an off day. Mm -hmm. Like why are you getting up at seven? We have all day. Right. But that's just how he did things. Very, very regimented. Right. And that was, he was always, I mean, I was in some of the best shape of my life when toward, um, in that last probably year and a half before everything happened, because I was up there, I was at their house a lot, like every few months and stuff. And when Chris was home, we would train together. He would drag me to the gym because Nancy was like, I'm not going to have a gym in the house. Why are we, <laughs> you know? But he liked to actually get up and go to a gym in Peachtree City. And he would drag me along. She's like, yep, yep, Sandra will go with you. I'm like, I couldn't move from the day before, you know. And we would come home. He's like, "Man, your sister's a beast. Once you get her in there, she's like, she won't stop. She wants to stay longer than me." And Nancy would shake her head, like, "Mm hmm," looking at him real sarcastically. He's like, "What's that face?" She goes, "And who do you think taught her how to do that?" And I'm like, she did. She did. Just since I was little, how to do reps with you know, you can have low weight, but do reps. Just do everything real slowly, and it'll make everything feel like it's fifty pounds heavier. You know, I heard all the tricks from her for over the years. So um, he was just very shocked and surprised by that that I could do that for so long and I cook a lot and uh, had my own restaurant for a while and so every time I was there that was my my job my go-to was making every meal and he'd every once in a while he'd walk through the kitchen and see what I was using he'd be like it's clean right it's clean all this is clean yes it's clean that's not real cheese it's vegan that's not oil it's this he's like oh okay all right <laughs> his his big uh, uh, treat was cheesecake oh right? that was the wedding cake Oh, was it yeah. cheesecake? Yep. Yeah, we he had, loved cheesecake. We yeah. ordered cheesecake from the Cheesecake Factory for their wedding because it was on Thanksgiving Day, so there wasn't, you know, we didn't go any. We had it at the house, we didn't go anywhere or do anything. And um, but I went into the fridge like the day before, and I saw this great big box, and I go, "What is that?" Chris like, "Oh." It's black tie raspberry cheesecake from the Cheesecake Factory. He's like, I'm going to eat half of it. <laughs> I was like, he says that, but he'll barely have a piece, you yeah, know, and yeah, then yeah. be down in the gym. So right. I was like, that, that's good. So he did have a couple of pieces. But, yeah. but, but you mentioned the, going to the gym with him, too, because I would, like, if we train together, which I just stopped doing it because I always felt like I had to keep up. Like, there was no option. Mm -hmm. And I remember we had a match one time in Japan, and I gave him a spin kick or something, and it missed. And he sold it anyways, but it didn't look like sometimes it just missed, but it goes by so fast. But he was so angry with that, that he goes, uh, after the match, I couldn't find him anywhere. I've been looking everywhere and he was like standing in the corner, like of a boiler room area. I'm like, what are you like? What, what's up? And he's like, ah, oh, I can't believe I sold that kick. And I just feel so bad. And he just, we went 20 minutes and like had a great match, but that one moment he couldn't let go of. And then he said, you know, I have to do squats. Like he had to purge himself mm -hmm. and I felt like, okay, well, I should do them with them. 500 hack squats. And I'm like, why am I doing this? Why are you doing this? But that he's like, he had to, like, you know, like I said, punish himself for mm -hmm. this mistake. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and that was once again, like, just this, I think, like you said, driven and intense. Yeah. Very intense guy. Mm -hmm. Very know? intense. There was always, no matter if it, what holiday it was or what was going on, um, there was always a layer underneath that even, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. but even looking back now, I'm not even 100% sure my sister ever permeated. There was just something underneath with him that kept him, it's funny that you say punishing himself because it, it almost seemed like self-flagellation for any kind of misstep or mistake in his life, not just professionally, but personally as well. So... Yeah, he was just he's he was a very intense person. You know, he had there were a lot of light moments and levity and and love along the way, but coming up to that to to the event, to things that happened, I had noticed that all of that 
light and levity was getting fewer and, and further between, you know, even with family. So, yeah, I uh, used to call him the Loch Ness monster because he would disappear for long periods of time and then suddenly he would like resurface. Uh, but if you didn't talk to him, then he would go back down under the depths and you wouldn't get a chance to, to hear from him from another month or so. So, and that was happening more frequently at the end. And we're going to talk about that and what happened once he became a huge celebrity after winning the championship at WrestleMania. But of course I want to hear more about the happier memories you have with your sister, Nancy and your, uh, your, your sweet, precious nephew, Daniel. But first, let me just say a quick word of thanks to the great sponsors of talk is Jericho in the midst of this very heavy show. And thanks for, for sticking with us, and thanks for supporting all the sponsors as well. I wouldn't be able to do this podcast for you for free twice a week if not for you and if not for our great sponsors, including True Car and the True Car app. Now, once again, I used my True Car to buy my 2016 Cadillac Escalade. It was so easy. It made the whole process so fast. I was in and out of the dealer in 90 minutes, okay? That's a record. 90 minutes, one hour and a half in and out of the dealership. How many times have you bought a new car or a used car? It takes hours, not with True Car, 90 minutes. And I also I bet you that you didn't know that using True Car and the True Car app can also be by a used car. Over half a million pre owned vehicles available from True Car certified dealers nationwide. So, whether you're looking for a brand new car or a gently used car, uh, you can get upfront pricing information from True Car so you can enjoy a better car buying experience. Using True Car and the True Car app lets you see what other people paid for the car you want. You can determine a fair price and feel confident when you buy your car. True Car connects you, I'm talking to you, man, with a local certified dealer if you choose who will honor your guaranteed savings and will make your car buying process quicker and easier. True Car users save an average of $3,279 off MSRP. That's a lot of cash. I saved uh, just a little bit under that, but it was close to that average. And over 2 million cars have been sold to True Car users by the nationwide True Car Certified Dealer Network. So don't worry about finding a certified dealer. There's over 11,000 of them in True Car's network, okay? So when you're ready to buy a new car or a used car, visit TrueCar.com or download the True Car app to enjoy a better better, quicker car buying experience. I know I did. I'm so glad that I used it. A 2016 Cadillac Escalade, brand new, sitting in my driveway right now, thanks to True Car. I want you to go check it out. You'll save money. You'll save time. You'll save your uh, your mental uh, health as well. Remember, some features are not available in all states. TrueCar.com. Go check it out now. It's your last chance to get great holiday savings at Guitar Center. Like a Yamaha portable keyboard, only $79. Add a month of lessons for only $99. Plus the newest and hottest guitars, drums, keys, and more. Exclusive gear you can't get anywhere else. Special financing and gift cards. The perfect present for every musician. So hurry in and find your sound at Guitar Center. Lessons available at select locations only. You mentioned uh, earlier about uh, the last year and a half. Did you start noticing? Because I, I noticed started noticing stuff too, mm-hmm. you know? I used to call Chris. I still do. He, uh, we called him Houdini because he would just. I don't. He would just disappear. Mm-hmm. Like he would. You never would know when he was leaving. If everyone was having some drinks at a bar or whatever, yep. even in the arena, he would just like poof. He's gone. Mm-hmm. And then I also call him the Loch Ness monster because he would surface and like call you on the phone. And if you missed that call, if he went back under, even three seconds later, you gone. wouldn't hear from him from like another month. Yep. And that started really getting more and more regular where it's like you know hey dude like you know and i just you can start like looking back now you can see that there's some stuff like that going on more and more frequently yes did you notice that and have the experiences with that as well definitely there were um way way more instances of that that's a great term Loch Ness Monster mm-hmm. because that's very very true you i get a random text or a random call and and then i call my sister and be like hey i just heard from chris and wherever Minneapolis, you know, is every, was everything okay at the match? Whatever. She's like, oh, he's probably, you know, had a drink, just wants to chat mm-hmm. with you and hear something funny or something. And I'm like, well, I missed, tried to call back. You know, she's like, oh, yeah, he's gone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, okay. But what really became noticeable was a little bit more of, like, a, a, a sense of unsafeness and, and paranoia for the family. Like, he just would like constantly be checking the alarm at night, constantly be checking things. And for himself, like when we would go to the gym and do things like that, he would take different ways every time. Like different routes yeah, to the gym? Yeah, different routes, the same gym, you know, all the time and around the same time every day, sometimes twice a day, as you know. Mm-hmm. And um, 
you know, the way we would go in the morning is not the way that we would go after dinner. And, you know, we'd take the Hummer one day, but then I had a Mustang at the time. He's like, Let, let's take the Mustang instead. And and never, ever, ever before had that been. He, he was used to be, you know, fairly laid back about mm-hmm. stuff like that. It was never, there wasn't ever any issue like that. So when it did start happening, it was something I noticed immediately. Mm-hmm. Like, what is the deal with this? What, you know, what is going on? And he seem to have a little bit more short patience with things um you know just that not having it sensibility like it's just you know over over certain things like you mm-hmm. know couldn't like it going into Publix and getting food and stuff he just he didn't want to do that anymore he wanted you know he'd tell me what he wanted and send me or or if nance and i were out during the day just call and say pick this up it was a huge personality change not crazy huge where everyone else would notice but people around him a lot would would notice and I didn't really understand what was happening and and to be frank I still kind of look back on it and like you know what was what was that and mm-hmm. was it a precursor to everything that happened I don't know you know so did you and Nancy ever talk about that we did a little bit and and she just said you know it's she chalked it up to part of the business as you know a lot of wrestlers have had you know, near misses and weird things happen with kidnappings and stuff in their family. I mean, one wrestler did have his child kidnapped years and years ago. Really? Here in the States, yeah. Oh, it, wow. was, it was a big deal a long time ago. Mm-hmm. Um, and so she had a little bit of concern about that, but not to the point of where, you know, I couldn't take him to Chuck E. Cheese or something because what if something happens? Right. Or, you know, there's someone following us or something. But she said she kind of chalked it up to it being about that. You know, the more... After WrestleMania, Chris's, I guess the way that he was perceived in the public and him being able to be in public went from us being able to have a halfway decent dinner with, you know, a few fans coming up to us not really being able to go. Yeah, he's a legit celebrity. He was he was a totally legit celebrity. Couldn't go to Disney World regular. We had to do the VIP store, Mm -hmm. you know, and all Mm -hmm. that stuff. So um, I think that a little bit of that after WrestleMania, everything kind of switched. You mean WrestleMania where he won the title? Right, right, right. And um, I think that it it changed a little bit for him getting recognized that much and made him a little bit more self-aware of, you know, if someone wants to get to me this much, what about my children? Right. And, you know, I and think that was a little part Once of again, it. mentioning earlier how uh, private, quiet, and also very shy. He was a shy guy, shy. which I think where the quietness came from. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure being out in public where people are coming up to you and, you know, wanting a piece of that wanting a piece of you was probably hard for him. Yes. You know? Yes. He was very, very kind to fans all the time. I don't think there's ever, I mean, even to this day, I don't think there's a story from a fan where he was yeah. a jerk and, you know, no, I'm eating. or how, Because when people would come up to us, he'd be like, yeah, you know what? If I'll give you, you know, 10, 15 minutes of my time as soon as my family and I are done eating, can you just let us finish? Mm-hmm. And people would absolutely be respectful of that for the most part, you know, never really had an issue. But he was good on his word. After, you know, after a meal or after drinks, he would go over to the people and, and sit with them and talk and, you know, ask people about, you know, and what do you do for a living? Mm-hmm. You know, always a little curious and interested, you know, what else was there besides wrestling in the yeah. world? Because he didn't really know. Right, you know? right, so, right. Like his, his whole life, he, he told me once he'd never had a job other than wrestling. Yeah. His first and only job his whole life was, was a professional wrestler. Yep. You know? Very much so. Did you spend time with his other kids, with uh, with David and Megan? Yes. Yeah. All the time. All the time. Every holiday mm-hmm. um, and summers. Okay. And they would come to the States. And every holiday, it wasn't a holiday without them. And I, I loved them just like, mm-hmm. just like I loved them. Daniel, because mm. there was never, my sister always used to say that step is a dirty word, mm. even way, way back when I was really little, because Kevin Sullivan had children as right. well from a previous marriage. So she's she was a stepmom twice to, you know, um, teenage kids mm-hmm. or middle, middle-aged kids, and we just never, ever called each other step. It was, you know, this is my niece and nephew. This, mm-hmm. So I was very, very close to them and very, very close to David. He, he was of that age where he was um, able to respond and laugh and get a lot of my jokes and wanted to play more and you know he was mm-hmm. he was that age where you could go and do stuff with him right right, right, right. Yeah, I got fun with <laughs> him yeah. yeah when Daniel was just a baby it's like okay he's sleeping now what do we do you mm-hmm. know all the, so they called me 
Well, Daniel called me Auntie Jaja because he couldn't, it was the oddest thing that he couldn't say Sandra at first when he was little. And of all names he could come up with, he came up with Jaja on his <laughs> own, which, as you know, is like, you know, a very fancy actress. <laughs> yeah. Which, but Zsa Zsa Gabor. Right. Yeah. And my sister got the biggest kick out of that because she's <laughs> like, oh man, he's got your number right from Jump Street. I'm like, what is the deal there? <laughs> so he just, and then I became Auntie Jaja to, him and also to the other kids. So mm -hmm. I just, I loved being with them and they would be like, hey, Aunt Chacha, let's go. You know, our name, their neighbor in Peachtree City had horses and mini horses and a whole farm next door. So we would always be over there playing with the animals and asking to feed them and, you know, doing all kinds of really cool stuff for really just a trip to Publix, going anywhere around the town, you know, that I could take them to go do something. Mm -hmm. Time well spent. I just I love those kids. Now Nancy and Chris were, were were great parents from what I could see. Absolutely. You know, Chris was a great dad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was. He, Any time that he could, he spent time with with all of his kids as much as possible. Um, whenever he was home, you know, from the road, that's all he wanted to do was spend time with Nancy, spend time with Daniel. That was it. Mm -hmm. And uh, and my sister lived and breathed for Daniel. I mean, that's just mm -hmm. bottom line. She, he was never, we had a, a running joke that she was going to have to shop for a prom dress because he was never going to leave her side <laughs> and she was going to have to go to prom with him. Like, that's so creepy. He doesn't want to leave your side. I'm like, you're not that much fun. She's like, I am. I'm a riot. I'm like, all right, I guess. <laughs> and being someone that she, helped, you know, practically raised, I'm like, I guess I can attest to yeah. that. All right. Yeah. You're right, pretty right, cool. Yeah. Like, yeah. She's 10 years older than you. So it is almost like a, another mother sort yes. of thing. I'm sure. Right? Yeah. yeah. She, it was a, an awful lot of babysitting. And yeah. so she she left to go into wrestling, but even then it was it was funny because it was almost like um, it was almost like having uh, divorced parents where my mom and dad would have me you know all week long and then one or two weekends of the month <laughs> Kevin and Nancy would get me yeah. you know and I get to go to the beach and hang out with Kevin and Nancy and Kevin was a child we used to throw we used to throw water balloons off the balcony <laughs> and stuff at the cars down in our condo parking lot and then run inside and act like it wasn't us and then the next day there'd just be splattered water and latex <laughs> everywhere and Kevin and I would just laugh and laugh and I think back on those times think man he was a 40 year old dude like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and like he was just having a good time and my sister just be in the kitchen laughing at us being silly so but with Chris, he was the same way when I could catch him like that to have a good time doing something if I could make something really, really fun. And it, those, as you said, being shy and being quiet, those moments when they did happen were pretty priceless. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, we had a New Year's Eve of 2000 um, was a super big night for us. We stayed home. They had just gotten their house together in Petrie City. My sister was pregnant. So she couldn't have any fun. So <laughs> Chris and I decided to take her fun for ourselves. <laughs> and we had an absolute blast. I mean, we stayed up all night. I think we were up till 4.30 or 5 in the morning just laughing and playing music and talking about movies and TV and um, and books. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's, I'm an avid reader. I manage a bookstore. And he was just constantly asking, you know, what are you reading? What can I take with me? What have you got? Just devouring things mm -hmm. you know so once again with that intensity mm -hmm. you know everything he did was was a thousand percent yep you know? and same thing with with music too i it was back in the days of cd burning <laughs> those ancient days of cd burning yeah right before ipods and um he was constantly asking me to make him make me a cd make me another road cd make me another workout cd all the time would you put on the cds oh my gosh <laughs> I know he was a big ACDC fan and Stones huge, fan. Yeah. He was a huge Stones fan. Um, there was a lot of Metallica on there. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of, this was back in the day when Eminem first mm -hmm. started. So there was an awful lot of Marshall Mathers on that guy. <laughs> um, and back when the Foo Fighters first came out, and I'm the world's biggest Dave Grohl fan, so there was an <laughs> awful lot of Foo Fighters on all of the CDs. Um, Pantera. 
and it's just really, yeah. really energetic. Really, energetic. Yeah. I was actually the, surprisingly with what just happened with Lemmy, but I was with him the first time he heard Ace of Spades. <laughs> and he made me play it three times. And we were in the car, we were in the Hummer together, and we just kept playing it on the way home from Atlanta over and over and over. He's like, man, what is this? <laughs> I'm like, what is it? I'm like, oh, wow. So, yeah, those times were, you know, the really great times that I like to try to remember mm -hmm. the most you know when i'm yeah, having on one of those. those days yeah when i'm feeling like you know how could this have happened and why did he do this to us one of those days i always you know to try not to live in a bitter mind and a bitter spirit i try to mm. remember those times and think you know that i don't know what happened but i want to try to remember that as much as i possibly can so, so. you know the, the, that weekend because like like you said earlier if you lined up a hundred people against the wall that knew Chris Benoit. A hundred of them would have nothing but good good stuff to say about him. I like all the guys in the locker room looked up to Chris, his peers, fans, and all that sort of stuff. And so when you start hearing about about this, you can't believe it because it's not that guy, you know. What did you see and and know in the events leading up to to that you know June weekend, June twenty second, twenty third? Were you talking to Nancy? Did you get any like something weird going on here? Or well, there had been prior to that there 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 was at least there were a couple, but there was at least one really high spot where he left the house and she had had a restraining order. He didn't get punch in the face physically violent but it was intense and uh he had he had pushed her hard and into an uh an island in the kitchen and you know she had kind of been down that road before in her life and saw it come in and recognized the signs was like just not this time mm -hmm. um called the police and he left the house and then she called me and I went down there and, and she ended up going to an attorney and started, you know, putting paperwork together to make sure that the restraining order stuck and this and that. And, um, it went on for about two and a half, almost three weeks. Uh, Mike Durham had come over to the house and he had gone out to meet with Chris and then come back to the house and, you know, trying to, smooth things over, as it were, um, between both of them, and then enlisted me in the effort and said, you know, I said, well, she's not going to talk to him. He's like, please, can you, if you just talk to him, talk to him on the phone, please. He just wants to talk. So I ended up talking to him on the phone, and he had convinced me. So I encouraged my sister to talk to him on the phone, and then they ended up working things out, and everything was okay. And um, that was about... I think it was about two years before everything happened. So somewhere in that, I think that a lot of it had to do with working. I think he was pushing himself an awful lot at work to get that push for that title. You know, mm -hmm. I think that he was feeling, as a lot of wrestlers do, feeling their age. I mm -hmm. think he was feeling his age and feeling like, you know, and you said it, he, he didn't have another skill, mm -hmm. he didn't have something else that he could do. So it started to close in on him that what is going to happen when all this goes away kind of feeling. And my sister was never worried about that because she's, you know, she was managing his career and she had, she already had other things lined up for him. Oh, she's she was like, his manager? Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. really? Yes. Okay. Yep. They had a, they, you know, he was a corporation or they had a corporation yeah. together um, and she, she was managed his career. and. They already had, uh, ironically, they already had plans for a wrestling school in Atlanta. Wow. And um, she had t-shirts made already. Really? So I'm like, I'm sitting on like 500. What's it ben called? Benoit Academy t-shirts. Wow. In storage, with gray with his, his image, his headbutt image on the back. And so she, I mean, she had logos designed. She was ready for the next move. And I don't think that he was in his mind physically emotionally i don't think that he i think he was just really scared so a lot of that i think started boiling over into their personal life i couldn't really 100 percent say for cert with certainty but as paul always reminds me you know you're the one person with the most insight to it because i was there for everything and leading up to it about a week before um we were nancy and i were 
I had something else going on in Florida. I was in North Carolina at the time. We had some uh, something else going on in Florida and a death to a, someone close to our family, a death to someone close to our family. And I was going to go home to Florida. And she was like, yeah, let's just wait, you know, wait till Chris comes home and, you know, maybe use some miles if you have to go, if this person ends up passing away. And then there was another wrestling death. There were two wrestling deaths right before Nancy and Chris. And that it both, it really started to put a strain on everything. I think that Nancy was getting nervous that something was going to happen to him or that he was going to get hurt. Um, with Eddie's death, it put a ton of pressure on Chris as well. And I said a long time ago to Paul that he was in a, a state of perpetual bereavement. He just, he was. He was yeah. in a state of perpetual bereavement. It just, it did not stop. And I think that when I said that to Paul, he's like, oh my God, that's it. I never thought, you know, he's like, you, that's it. He well, was. He was. Let me expand upon that because I was going to say this. You mentioned Mike Durham, and he I know he Johnny Grunge. He was kind of the, the middleman and a real calming influence, as crazy as he was. I know he was very involved. You mentioned that he you know helped Chris and Nancy back together. Johnny passed away. He did. Then a short time later, a guy called Black Cat, Victor Marr, who was one of Chris's mentors in Japan, passed away. After that, a guy called uh, Ray Trailer, who was the big boss man, I'm sure you know all these guys another friend of chris and after ray passed away chris called me and he was crying 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 and he said he said i can't take it i can't take any more of my friends dying and lo and behold a year or so later his best friend dies his like i mentioned it was dean and jericho and it was eddie and, and chris and those two guys always got along i don't know what it was with them but they had a connection that no one else had in the ring out of the ring and Eddie's funeral, Chris, he, he came up to me once again crying and was hugging me like a like a child hugging a, a, a mom or a dad that doesn't want to be taken away. Like just this, but just cr crushing, heart crushing reaction. Mm -hmm. And I, I agree with, I think that put him over the edge to where, you know, like you said, perpetual bereavement. That's such a good point, you know? Mm -hmm. it, it was constant and, and it was as much, as much less whatever losses he suffered, obviously Nancy just being his wife suffered along with him, but also with being in the business, she suffered. The right. Well, yeah, losses. yeah, yeah. They knew, were, knew all of those people as well as they were her, her friends, friends too. Yes, very much. So. Right. And, you know, prior to that long, long before that with, um, with Liz's death. Yeah. And then right after black cat, uh, it was, there's another female death. And God forbid, Sherry Martel. It was Sherry. Yeah. yeah. When Fabulous Sherry died, that was um, that was the one of the last conversations I had with my sister. Uh, was after Sherry died, she called me, just crying, 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 and she just was like, "It just won't end. It just won't end." Mm -hmm. And I was like, "I know, you know, just trying to be that understanding sister." But I really, I couldn't wrap my head around it because I had lost a couple of friends. I was sort of young back then, but I lost a few friends, but not like what they were experiencing was just, you know, palpable pounding of grief, and it was affecting everything and there was a lot of self-medicating going on in that house you know mm -hmm. both of them I and mean, my sister's not a saint no i've never ever claimed for that to be but it was really really next level after all of those events especially after eddie with mm -hmm. chris mm -hmm. um and i know that because i was in the house and i can say that and it's not a secret yeah um again growing up in and around that business i i know for a long time of all the medication that sometimes takes for guys to get out in the ring you know and i i get it and i've seen it and it's one of those sort of knowns uns, unspoken knowns of the business right, like yeah right, yeah right. you know we get it but when it starts to be like you know you need eight to be up you need three to be down you know i used to I tell my sister, it's, I called it Judy Garland syndrome. I'm like, oh my mm -hmm. God. It, I like he's, and one of the jokes would be like, he's filming The Wizard of Oz, yeah. joking around about Chris. I'm like, he's yeah. filming The Wizard of Oz today. Uh, like, he's out there. And, and I got it. It's, you know, especially after 
suffering the grief and loss that I've suffered, I, I went down that road for like a year after it. And finally, one morning, sat up and said, my God, I'm doing the same thing. What am I doing? So dumb, you know? Mm-hmm. And then finally, you know, worked my way out of it. I could hear my sister's voice like, God, idiot. This is what was going on. Don't be that way. And I think that it was a huge contributing factor to what happened. And it's not... You know, I can say it's just my personal opinion, but it's actual facts. I mean, uh, the autopsy says so. I had seen it prior to that, the alcohol and the medication, not just the steroids, but everything else that had been going on. It was, it was a huge factor. Mm. And I know that, you know, everyone talks about the a concussion issue with Christopher, and I am certain that that maybe played a role as well. You know, I don't really wholeheartedly take uh, the, the the institute's findings on on his on his brain yeah. f- at 100% value either. But mm-hmm. um, if it was maybe at MIT or Harvard or not some school in West Virginia or some right, you know, right. house paid school in West Virginia, different yeah. story. But still, the autopsy never said you know he has Alzheimer's. He couldn't find his way to you know he, he couldn't find his way out of a paper bag. He couldn't remember people. That wasn't Chris. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know the things that they're saying that were linked to concussions. That wasn't Chris. It wasn't ever what I observed ever. That guy could get in and out of an airport in eight minutes flat, and I mean any airport. <laughs> like mm-hmm. you know when he's only been in once or twice. Right, you know right, right. No, not not to mention Atlanta. I could probably drop him off, spin him around downstairs in parking, and <laughs> kick him through the door, and he'd find his way to the plane. Yeah. So it it just it wasn't that people didn't. And this is actually the first time that I've I've spoken about it. I've only ever given one interview in nine years, and it wasn't mm-hmm. really even an interview. It was just um, me talking to a, a friend. Uh, that also happened to be a blogger for a wrestling magazine in Canada. Mm-hmm. And it was the first time that I had ever spoken about it. I and mean, we've never spoken to anyone, but it's upsetting because with Chris's dad and, and the big push for it to be, you know, concussion, concussion, this is why he did it, because the Crispin Wall we know could never have done this. They want to put it on something that, you know, this is the reason. Okay, good. We don't have to, you know, blame Chris anymore. But it was it was a combination of a lot of things. I think that it was, uh, again, just a, a huge boulder of weight from loss and grief. I think that it was a ton of medication, uh, altering his body chemistry, brain chemistry, alcohol, everything that was going on at, at that time, and possibly, yes, also a little bit of brain issue from hitting his head constantly over and over and over. Mm-hmm. Um, would it drive someone to murder? I don't know. These questions are out there with the NFL and these things. Now, you know, I can't say definitively, yes, that's what did it. I know there were issues in in, in the house that he was having, again, with himself struggling inside with things mm-hmm. that, you know, are privy to he and I and my family and my sister that I wouldn't put mm-hmm. on blast for mm-hmm. anyone to know. Um, but that coupled with the, the facts of what I know from being there immediately after that weekend and seeing everything. It wasn't the act of someone, you know, with brain damage. It, it wasn't, it's impossible. Mm-hmm. It's impossible for that to have been the case. And I understand being someone that has, has is experiencing this loss still almost nine years later, I understand the necessity to want to put it on something and say, this is why he did it. This is the reason right here. Because the daily pain of living with not knowing why and not really knowing what happened is crippling. Yeah. For lack of a better term. Right, right, right. It's, it is, it's crippling. And I, I can understand his, his parents and his family wanting to, to be able to say, this is why he wasn't himself because of this reason. And I just don't, I don't believe he was himself, yes, but, you know, I don't, I can't put it on any one thing. It was a combination of many things, outside factors, and an inner struggle that he had been going through for quite some time Mm -hmm. after Eddie. And as you mentioned, with everyone else, with Cap, with with Grunge, it just, he almost always kind of felt, had this look in his eye like, you know, 
it wasn't more of who's next. It was more of am I next hmm. in his eyes. So, you know, it's um, it's interesting. I did a couple shows after it happened because I wanted to go on there and, and be the other side of the coin because everyone was talking about evil wrestling and Chris Ben was a demon. And I wanted to let people know that there was another side to this guy. And this weekend was a very, I mean, a complete anomaly to what, what you would know about him but there was a dark side to him too but anyways my point is there was a, a psychiatrist that was on Larry King mm -hmm. who was saying what you just said from the evidence that we have here and the stories that we're hearing you can't pin it on A, B, C, D it's a combination it's the perfect cocktail of all of these things coming to a head at the same time mm -hmm. but the thing for, for me Sandy is like listen you know anybody that's ever been in a relationship or married like you can understand if in a moment of rage you can't agree with it but you could understand how how someone could you know kill their wife but but it's daniel was always to me like that i don't understand that mm -hmm. in any way shape or form mm -hmm. do you have any theories I don't. I hear that more often than you'd ever imagine. I'm sure, of course I mean, you do. You know, and people say, and and it's a legitimate, absolute, true statement of of opinion that you know, yeah, you could see because it happens all the time, sadly, right. in this country. Right. Um, that that but, moment of rage. Yeah. Oh no! And, what did I do? And then it's like, oh my god, what happened? Yeah. And I I could have understood that, but what a lot of people didn't get to see is that is how much my sister and he loved one another mm -hmm. and i think that if that is what happened on friday night and there was a moment of rage and and to be clear it was serious rage like he brutalized my sister oh okay yeah and a lot of you know and even though the police report is you know that's freedom of information act in the country and people can kind of see some things in the police report on the internet and have you know but they didn't have to see what I saw. And I, I have to put that out there as fact. He brutalized my sister. Oh, it wow. wasn't just like maybe maybe I hit her too hard and she, she hit her said, head. Oh, wow. He, he yeah. murdered her mm -hmm. brutally. And again, not being the Chris that I would equate with that. You know what I mean? That right. Yeah, I, yeah. Couldn't, I couldn't reconcile the man I just talked to a week and a half before with... with what I was facing when the police released the house t to me, you know what I mean? I it it. When you mean when you mean they released the house, you went inside and yeah. After at the saw the crime event. scene, right? Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, not with any. I understand. Yeah, there. but yeah. yeah. And I could not rec reconcile what again what what was physically there, or what we witnessed to, to the person that I just spoke with a week and a half, but. With Dan, it's um, there's nothing. There's not a word. I mean, I'm I'm pretty erudite. I find, I can usually find the vocabulary for many things. But when I try to talk about my nephew, with that hindsight, it's difficult because I can't. I don't understand it, and I don't understand. I say that I don't understand it because you know you think about a, a, a murdered child. It's just like it's the worst thing ever. But when when you think about that murder child as like the one person in life that you love more than anything, because I did, and my sister did, and and he did, so it's very hard for me to think of what had to be going on in his head, and in the house or in his heart to, to do that. He knew for a fact that had anything ever happened to he or Nancy that I. I, right. I would be there to take care of Daniel a hundred percent. You know, there's no question about that. Um, so it's not like okay, his mother is dead, and I'm right, going to jail for no life. Right. He has no one. Right. right. He has no one. I'm just going to end yeah. this for this yeah. kid. Right, he, right. he, you know, it would have been a dif difficult time, but he would have had a, a loving, a more than loving family um, to, to take right. care of him. Right. Right. And uh, I, I, all I can think of is that. You know, it, it was kind of a selfish last act to do that. He just, you know, I'm not sure. I really, I can't put it, put it, put a reasoning behind it. 
um, it's it's very difficult because again he he did love Daniel very much and all that I could really think is that you know if Daniel ever saw or found out what he had done to his mother that would have it would have broken that child Mm -hmm. so I don't know if he if that was going through his head I don't know how far his his thought process was even you know right. rendering his actions at that time like I don't know you know he might have just been completely out of his mind and but it happened over the course of a few days though it did. is that it I was, mean that's the the story at least yeah that's it is exactly what happened that they um, my sister was killed Friday evening um, between 11 and 1 a.m. and then uh, Saturday morning uh, Daniel was killed and then Chris killed himself Sunday evening so he spent two full days in the house with Nancy and Daniel not alive which is just again super out of character not just out of character no. but that's he, let's be honest yeah. with, that's weird well, like, that's, that's insane he's, he's, lo- he's lost his mind at right, this point right right that's like that's not there's he's, no justification yeah. for that that is that's, you're sitting in the house with your right. dead family that yep. you murdered yep. for a couple of days mm-hmm. and and for all reasoning and from reports that we had from the office, like when I called the op at the, the office, the WWE, WB, yeah. when I spoke at the office with Jen, she's like, you know, he he called. He was like trying to make a flight. Like he, and she, she just kept st- you know stuttering, like yeah, yeah, trying yeah. to wrap her. Like what the hell was he doing? Like right, you know, right. kind of like, and, and he was trying to change his flight and get to the match. Like would he think that no one knew that he did? It was just. You could kind of see where his logic was skipping in mm-hmm. and out of reality. Right. You know, yeah, I mean, yeah, just, yeah, yeah. just um, I think that his default mode, as we alluded to before, was to focus on work, focus on getting, you know, getting the job mm-hmm. and default to what he knew to do. Go to the airport, go to work, Russell, come home, take shit. You know what I mean? Just like, because mm-hmm. he, but then I think that his, the psychotic break that he had was still very much happening so he was having these moments of lucidity where i have to go do these things but then he didn't even realize that he's in the throes of a complete psychotic break you just murdered your family would you know it was very and then of course that that completely took over when he became suicidal or it could have been his plan all weekend Mm -hmm. i really don't know i really i can't say whether or not that that was his plan all weekend i know that the in the search engine on the computer that he had researched um, the quickest and easiest way to break a neck. Really? Yeah. And the story was that he basically put the, was it the pull-down rack around his neck and just let go of the pull-down handle on a, on a weight stack mm-hmm. and just let go? With a towel, yeah. He had a towel around his, around, around the... And even that, like... The, the, it's not out. It's, it's the strength to do that because I'm, I'm assuming oh, yeah. to be able to break your neck, you'd need a whole stack of plates mm-hmm. to pull it down in that position. Like you're dealing with otherworldly, you know, superhuman strength. Superhuman strength going on here. Mm-hmm. That's what the police said. Wow. Like there wouldn't have been if he hadn't been who he was. Uh huh. It would not have killed. You know, it yeah, would never yeah, have worked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, right. No one else could have pulled that. And, and, w- and what a way to to do it. Like. It's so tied into him. Like he was obsessed with lifting weights, and that's what basically he killed himself by. I've always hypothesized, sometimes with Paul, and sometimes after a couple of cocktails, yeah. but always, you know, thought, I think that he thought that the business was, was choking him, was killing him. I mm. think that he thought that everything about it, that the fame that ended up coming after winning, um, WrestleMania, I think that the the devastation of losing friends in the business to, you know, let's face it, some medical conditions that could have been avoided um, yeah. if they were truck drivers or yeah, right. bus drivers or, you right. know, plumbers. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is what everyone signs up for. So I've never, I've never, you know, gone, gone hard on that issue. I know what it is, but I just thought that how strangely and grotesquely poetic that it was that he did that. That he killed himself by breaking his neck, which he had already done once in the ring. So it just, there had to be some thought process to that, which has always kind of eaten away at Mm -hmm. me a little bit. There had to be some kind of thought process to that, that he ended up going out that way. 
after what he had done upstairs. I mean, it took time. All of what he did took time, you know. I it's mean, not like you're just putting a gun in your mouth and going, Psh! Right. Like, you actually would have to, like you said, construct an apparatus, you know, to figure out how to do this. Yeah. I mean, he researched it. Like, he researched it. It's just really, you know, because obviously the police took the computer and, you know, we were involved with the detectives the whole time. I mean, it was in his search history. That's just... Also, that's something that's kind of not yeah. Chris because he wasn't. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. He wasn't. He big wasn't on a computer doing guy. No, yeah. he wasn't. And no. it was just all, all of it was just super, super weird. And then to have an odd religious aspect to it of putting my sister's Bible next to her and a Bible next to Daniel of you know what did you think that that was going to do for them or maybe did you think it was going to absolve you because. They weren't a religious people. <laughs> yeah. I mean, my sister and I were raised Catholic, but um, they were trying to get Daniel into private school. So they started kind of, you know, here in the States, if you want to get a kid into a private school run by a church, you have to be a church member. Yeah. That's sort of the yeah, deal. Yeah, 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 yeah. So they had to sh show their face at a couple of services to try to get them into the school. But it wasn't, there was no kind of conversion that they, you know, all of a sudden they had found God. Chris was very interested mm -hmm. let's put it that way in different all kinds of different religious philosophy eastern religion um there we both shared this book called um um the life life of buddha and christ the pair and it was a book on the parallels of buddha and christ and we were both just fast we discussed it for hours mm -hmm. we were both so fascinated by it you know and and i was like you think that's crazy don't even let me throw muhammad in there because yeah. he's it's like there's parallels between all of them he's like what and so he started reading about that just again not interested but not practicing mm -hmm, mm -hmm. let's just put it that way so when that was the other thing that the police talked to us about i just i was completely baffled by that as well his religious involvement as far as i know was basically through eddie yes you know i know there was a couple of times because eddie was very very god-fearing and knew so much about the bible and could quote the bible and because they spent so much time together i think that always rubs off to where you're interested you know, and we used to pray sometimes before matches. Mm -hmm. Eddie started doing that, and Chris would always be involved in that. So there was, like you said, some spiritualness there. But to drop a Bible, you know, that was felt to me once again. What is who is this guy? Right. You know? Not something you'd be like, oh yeah, that's so him. Yeah. Right. <laughs> like <laughs> you know? yeah. Just not that at all. And the other the thing with after Eddie's death as well because um, my sister had spoken with Vic about it and Vic grew yeah, yeah, yeah. and um, my sister had spoken to Vic about it and and then she reached out to me. I had lost someone close to me in my life and gone through a tough time and um, you know went to a, a grief counselor who encouraged me to start a journal and write to that person. Like I was just having trouble get through, getting through my daily, right. you know, go to work, just yeah. the mundane things of life when, you, when you're when you so grief stricken, you're like, oh, what does it all mean? What am I yeah, even yeah, doing yeah, this yeah. for? That depression of asking the big questions, my sister uh -huh. always put it, you know? And um, so I said, well, you know, when I went after Jim died, this helped me. And I started this journal, and it was more like a diary, but instead of saying, Dear Diary, I just wrote to Jim every day yeah. in my journal. And she's like, God, that's a great idea. Okay, I'm going to go. I'm going to go hang up. I'm going to go get him a journal. And she went right out that same day and brought home, like, three beautiful journals for him to pick from. And, she, and she's like, you know, Sam had this idea, and that helped her. And she's like, you know, if you want to do it, you can. If you don't want to, you don't have to. And he sure did. He picked that journal up immediately and started writing to Eddie. Um, and and then stopped, like, about six, three months before everything mm -hmm. started happening. Mm -hmm. So it's very weird. And timing. And the things in the journal were, you know, it, it, mundane stuff, like, you know, here's what, you know, I had this and this and this to eat today, mm -hmm. or, oh, I did legs today, and it was this and this, or, oh, we're back in Kansas City, or it was just... Stream of consciousness Stream stuff, of consciousness, right? you know, stuff he would talk to, to Eddie about, you know, text on the phone, or that he would be there to share with him. Mm -hmm, and I, mm -hmm. I, it it kind of seemed like it was helping until all of a sudden everything else started pounding away with, with Mike dying, and uh, as you said, it was just like four or five great big giant things in a row sort of put him back in that headspace mm -hmm. again i think yeah we let's that's that's the hardest thing about 
about this whole situation is we just don't know. You know, we don't know, we don't know, and we never will know. Yeah. You know, like I was even saying, like this. I mean, it could be freaking demonic possession for all we know. There's like, there's no, there's no answer. Right. You know what I mean? I definitely know that it wasn't an outside source. Let's just put the let's just let the internet calm down. It wasn't. There, you know, my ex brother in law was certainly not involved. Right, right. Um, right. In fact, he just gave an interview a few weeks ago that was um, very kind toward my sister and and my family. He was in my life for a decade, Mm -hmm. just like Chris was. So, um, and he he put out there that yes, I can't have children either. Um, Mm -hmm. And so it is the only grandchild that my mom and dad will have. And he said in the interview how heartbroken that he is for them. Mm-hmm. And and for me, and that was nice of him to say. Mm-hmm. You know, he's got his own life and his own deals going on. But uh, it was it was nice for him to sort of reach out a little yeah, bit yeah, through yeah. the media that way. Right. But it, it's been a difficult road uh, trying to come back from it. And every single day, there's there's not a day that goes by that I don't think of Chris's kids as well, which is something that you and I have, have mm-hmm. talked about personally. Um, and hadn't I hadn't been in touch with them for over, you know, eight years until I just recently got back in touch with David, and uh, it was a big deal for me. Mm-hmm. I think it was a big As deal I'm sure for him us. too. Yeah, I, I think that it was. I mean, we, you know, we there were some tears on the phone, and you know, um, and his one question to me that really broke me apart was, "Why did you wait eight years?" Mm. <laughs> and I just my heart sank, you know, and I was like, I tried, and I did try to reach out to him several times, and and. Um, it was thwarted by other family members, and so I just sort of, I hate to say it, but I, I kind of gave up and thought, well, maybe it's too much for him. Because mm-hmm. a lot of times and a lot of days, it's too much for for me as well. You just, you don't want to be, yeah. you don't want to be David Benoit. Yeah. You don't want to be Nancy's sister, you know, just yeah. for a moment, because you don't want to have to deal with it and think about it. So I can understand Um but I'm so grateful and very, very happy that we're back in touch and communicating because, you know, he'll always be my nephew. Yeah. You, know, you guys are both, both you and Megan too, all three of you lost such a huge part of your life. You're all you have left in a lot of ways from that life. Mm-hmm. Very know? much so. Very how much how so. was it for you? I mean, just the, I mean, I know for me too, and I'm a little bit more thick skinned about it, but just the whole media deluge afterwards of course it was like you know the irony of it once again talking about not only how he killed himself but the fact that the one thing he loved he almost destroyed the whole wrestling business yeah it did. like the WWE almost went down it was that close I know and just because of all the the attention on this horrible crime I mean you were stuck right in the middle of this I had to drive with a pillowcase on my head to go to Publix. <laughs> really? Was, yeah, we well, they the police released the house to us, um, and we couldn't leave. Um, it's it's not a secret because it was plastered all over the news. But there, we had a front gate, and I say we because in the the six months, six to eight months leading up to this, there was talk between Chris, Nancy, and I about building a second sort of a in-law house because oh, yeah, yeah. it was eight acres and Chris was like you know do you think that you could garden and I was like I don't know dude I'll <laughs> give it a shot like what's the deal with that he's like, and he's like let's get some books you want to go to the bookstore and get, I'm like you want me to get some books he's like yeah I'm like on gardening he's like yep I'm like all right what do we what do we what do we make it yeah. like something for profit what's the deal he's like no 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 like herbs and, and vegetables and stuff you know for to, to cook clean I was like, oh, yeah, okay, I get it. He's like, yeah, because, you know, if we have another kid, then Nancy's going to need the help. So this was the plan less than six months before all this happened was they were planning on having another child. And, you know, with her trying to run things, the business side of things, and having two kids and a household to run, he was enlisting my help. Mm-hmm, They're like, mm-hmm. hey, want to drop everything and come sort of be a cook slash nanny yeah, work slash as a nanny, yeah. workout buddy? And yeah. I was like, come on, spend every day with my cool as heck sister and my <laughs> awesome nephew yeah man that's, yeah. A, that's a no-brainer so it had just started to be like that but you know when they released the house to us afterward there's about a, a half an acre from the gate to the front house and it was just inundated with news crews just mm. absolutely inundated in fact i crawled <laughs> I crawled through a small hole in her our neighbor's her neighbor's fence, Holly. Um, she's the one that actually found them. Mm-hmm. as well documented in the news. Um, and we had stayed at her house 
the day before, um, it was another 24 hours before the police released the house to us, so we were staying next door. And I kind of snuck through the back and came on and then went running into the side door so cameras couldn't catch me and then have my open the gate so my mom and dad could drive in. Oh. It was just, we had no idea how bad it was going to get. And what was reported, we, we were told by everyone that we knew and that loved us just not to have, turn a TV on. Just yeah, yeah. keep things quiet, Not don't turn anything on, don't do this, that. So we did, we just sort of sat in the house for about a good long while, just sort of staring at each other because we didn't know what to do. And then all of a sudden my mom was like, well, let's do some laundry. Hmm. Let's do the dishes because all of the dishes were still in the sink from, you know, they had barbecue on Friday because Daniel, Daniel had just finished his um, horse riding lessons next door and it ended with a little like carriage ride around the circle mm -hmm. where they lived. And so they had kind of a celebra celebratory you mm -hmm. know, barbecue mm -hmm. out back for him finishing his first horse training yeah. summer. And um, so all those dishes were still sitting in the sink and like, you know, there was just household stuff to be done. And my mom was just like, you know, your sister would be pissed that her house is a mess. Yeah. And I was like, okay. And we just sort of started doing things like that. But I couldn't go upstairs to the office because there was blood all over the floor. And I couldn't go down down downstairs into the finished basement where my, my mom and dad's apartment was. There was a, a second kitchen and a whole area where my mom and dad stayed, but the gym was off to the right and the doors were open and there was police tape on it. So couldn't, I couldn't really go down there because that was terrible. And then couldn't go up to the third floor to the kids suite where my room was because I slept next to Daniel. His room was next to mine. And so I just like emotionally couldn't do it. So <laughs> For three days straight, I sat. We sat on, wait, stayed on the couches, mm. and they're like just really, you know, put pillows out there. Like, what am I going to do? Right. And just totally in a state of shock. Anyways, like regardless, yeah, but we couldn't turn lights on or TVs on at night because as soon as a light would go on, the floodlights from CNN would hit the house and light the house up because mm. they would think, oh, if we can get a shot of the family walking around in there, yeah, 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 you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's Just like, it's whatever, the most yeah. morbid garbage yeah. craziness. And, um, I had people magazine show up to my gate. Right. I'm like, like, why are you even here? Like, yeah. go away. F how? off. How? Yeah. Like how do you even yeah. right. <laughs> oh, I'm just from Miami. Came, drove up. Get the hell out of here. I know. It's you know? the worst. And even more so was, it was difficult because there were fans at the gate too. Right. And so, yeah, yeah. you know, then they're interviewing fans, which we know aren't the super most sometimes reliable sources of information. Let's just put it that way. Yeah, yeah. Although, you know, I love my sister's fans and, and Chris's, I understand, but come on, you know, they don't know what the hell's going on in that house and they mm -hmm. don't know anything about it. Even the district attorney, um, Scott Ballard, he had to retract a statement that, I mean, we completely, I lost my mind about, I really lost my mind about when they said that my nephew was sick. I had like fragile X syndrome or something yeah, those lines, yeah. Like I completely lost my mind. I went to his pediatrician's office, I got his medical records, and I, I mean, and I made him, I was like, you're going to have to go publicly on television and apologize. You don't know what the hell you're talking about. They said there were track marks on my nephew's arm, which is preposterous. It was nothing of the sort, not in the Emmy report, not ever. And on top of that, anyone who's even remotely acquainted with the bodybuilding or wrestling or any kind of sports now in general, <laughs> Major League Baseball, knows that you don't put steroids in someone IV. It's an IM situation mm -hmm. everybody knows that right, or right, anyone right, right, who would right, think right, knows right. that so there was a speculation that like you know he's got track marks was he giving his son steroids just this madness on mm -hmm. television yeah. where i just yeah. was losing my mind i the for the 20 minutes that i did end up turning on and watching it i was like boy that yeah, was a mistake. so many yeah right <laughs> that right. was a mistake yeah. you know like right. I, I really couldn't believe it and i really Interestingly enough, besides that and the, the fragile things, which it, it is absolute garbage, not even close mm -hmm. to true. Daniel was exactly like Christopher. He had his exact, not exact, because he had this wild streak of Nance in him too, mm -hmm. where he'd just be crazy yeah, funny yeah. maniac style. But for the most part, he was a shy kid. He did not talk to you unless he knew you. He mm -hmm. didn't want 
anything to do with you. Right, you right. know, he just was not like that, and that's how Chris was. And people took that for him being slow being or being slow right, yeah. or something. And that was not the case. He was so smart. I mean, ridiculously smart. And Chris was too. That's was my sister. Mm-hmm, it's just mm-hmm. it's just preposterous. Had something like that been wrong with him, had he had whatever fragile X is or any form of uh, been on the autism spectrum had mm. had downs or had you know right. any kind of a issue not only would they have addressed it and gotten him the best of care of anything but chris would have come out as an advocate for any of it he yeah. would never have been ashamed of something like that neither would my sister neither would my family so mm. it just was you know again one of those post post mm. um tragedy yeah, everyone's looking for an answer once again, yeah, yeah. whatever it could be, you know. And growing up in this business, also everybody's looking for an angle. Yeah, everybody wants their ten minutes on King. Oh my or, gosh, did you ever see that? Minutes. All these idiots coming out of the woodwork. It was just, you know. My goodness. It was. Uh, That's why I went and finally did it because I was sick of seeing all these no names that didn't even know Chris going on screen and being the experts. It's like, who the hell are you? Yeah. It was 60 year old wrestler Haven for a while. I'm yeah. Like, you know, just any, hasn't been around for- <laughs> yeah. Like, do you even know him? No, not at all. You know, and, and you said something else too, that, that I think gets lost in all this. Cause it's all Ben, why Ben, why Ben, why Ben, but you mentioned, you know, my sister's fans, you know, Nancy was a very respected, you know, she wasn't in the business anymore, but in her time for, 10, 15 years, she was 20 years, Mm -hmm. especially 10, 15 of those on the national, she was a big star. Huge. You know, and you forget about the fact that, that, you know, Nancy Benoit Sullivan, woman, fallen angel, whatever she was, Robin Green, (laughs) was was murdered too. You forget, and and that always bugged me, that, you know, (laughs) that bugged me. So glad you said that. It's been my, the bane of my existence for, for the past you know, again, almost nine years this June is I can't stand that my sister's mentioned as an afterthought right. in everything. And yes, it's awful and horrible that my seven year old nephew lost his life. Yes. Are you kidding me? Yes. It's something that is the worst thing people can think of. But my sister was a huge contributor to the wrestling business yeah. for decades. Mm-hmm. For decades. And didn't hurt people. She, you know, like you said, she was always funny, cracking jokes, and she was the, the mom of the dressing room. Friendly to everybody friendly from to, day one. She was always nice to me. I was a nobody. Yeah, you know? she just, you know, constantly sewing tights and um, doing makeup and popping on Liz's eyelashes when they constantly fall up. And you know, <laughs> and she would bring because Liz didn't drink. Mm. So um, when the stick with. Rick and and Liz and she in um, WCW when they would come out on his arms and whatever and they would do the champagne, she would always have like apple cider for Liz so she wouldn't have to drink champagne. I mean, she was just thoughtful, thoughtful, thoughtful. She thought about everyone else before herself always. And she did a great Jim Barnett impersonation. She's a famous character. My boy, hello, my boy. That's the first time I ever heard who Jim Barnett was because she would talk about she, that. Try the swordfish. You know? She really did. She, yeah. And I'll tell you another another wrestling legend, a Florida wrestling legend, Gordon Soley, mm-hmm. was just enamored with her, oh, and yeah. it was almost like the creepiest thing because he was like he was really in love with her, and it was adorable, but it was also a just little like, bit creepy. So weird. She would like make these eyes on him, like you know, but she would play. And she would make him so uncomfortable when they would shoot promos. She would make him so uncomfortable it made him crazy, you know. And Hump, uh, Sir Oliver Humperdinck, yeah. one of her very best friends, one of my very best friends in the business. I, he's sadly passed away also mm-hmm. two years ago. Um, he loved it. He would make he would egg her on so much when they were cutting promos, like oh, make him as uncomfortable, make him stutter, make him stutter. You know, he just he he worked it with her. Yeah. And those were. Those are the days of wrestling that I, even as a, because I was so young, but even as a kid, I look back on it and I'm like, man, that was a good time. Mm-hmm. Those were the good times. You know, yeah, it might have been everybody piling into vans and driving across Florida and this and that, but, you know, God, that was, it was a good time. Yeah. And it's become, you know, everything that it is now. And it's great and reaches so many people and, and that's wonderful, but it's cost an awful lot. Mm-hmm. It sure has. It has cost an awful lot. That is a great, know? that's a great statement you know Mm -hmm. to the point where the whole concept of the business as far as the testing involved and they're so gun shy about and and in a good way i mean gun shy might not be the right word but 
hitting guys in the head with chairs. That all stems from Chris and Eddie. Mm -hmm. And Eddie is still very much given legendary status in the company, and Chris has been eliminated mm -hmm. from the books forever. Mm -hmm. You know, And it's, it's one of those things where um, it's uh, obviously understandable for me. I don't want to see... You know, no. I don't want to be watching USA and 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 see him cut to a, a promo of Raw that's got like a classic match of Chris Benoit. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. That would break me probably. But there is a small part of me because again, hearing my sister's voice in my head, she was just a very, she was a very big believer in forgiveness mm -hmm. and not holding on to stuff that you know was going to turn you into a terrible person or, right. or, or hurt you in your life. And I think that I've dealt with my feelings, my very complicated feelings for Chris um, with her in mind. And that, you know, I, do I think that it's the right thing for them to never, ever mention him again? I don't know. I'm still, I don't know that I'm there yet. Mm -hmm. If that makes it's sense. Hard. I don't know that I'm ever going to be there. Yeah. But... I know a lot of people expect me to be, he's a murderer, he's the worst person on earth, which I know is, in the one interview that I had done before, shocked um, Dina, the, the blogger from the wrestling uh, site in Canada. She's just like, I, I never expected you to be so, you know, almost warm yeah. toward him. And it's hard to turn that off. It's hard to turn off the love and affection that you had for someone who's the father of your nephew, yeah. who's, your, you know, your sister. It's very difficult to turn that off and just go straight to, he's a murdering, mm. you know, mm. bleep, and I can't stand him. It just, it doesn't work that way. That's why it is very complicated. Um, but he lived for his job, his profession, and his, his, I mean, it was his art form. He was, he was one of the best ever. Mm -hmm. You know, you're talking about, yeah, his art form. Like, some of my best matches... I can't put on DVDs. I can't include in any of my, you know, retrospective career, you know, bios in the WWE because they don't exist anymore. Yeah. You know. And I and I always take that into account as well. And you know, it's good to talk about that because it should be known that my family has never been the one to say, you yeah. know, we've never gone to court or gone to say to to the office and they're like never again or yeah. we're gonna we're gonna sue you or we're gonna do whatever for you know uh just whatever pain and suffering never ever have i said that mm -hmm. none of us have not it's just me and my parents but we've never done that never said that it was a, a decision you know by corporate mm -hmm. do i think it's the right decision at this time yes i agree I yes agree. i don't think anyone's ready for that i don't think yeah. i know that every time hall of fame comes around there's always a big push oh. on the internet chris Moore should be inducted in the hall of fame that's just not gonna happen. how could you ever do that how, that's never you know, gonna how happen. could you ever do they, that? they gotta they gotta let that go yeah. that's just not ever yeah. gonna happen should he be a rate you know because the internet exists he's never going to be erased from anything mm -hmm. you know so that's out there but as far as you know an induction or, or anything like that or you know they've already started letting his matches come back a little bit yeah, on the network, the network yeah. and that you know and i've seen that as well but again it's interesting that they would do that but where are all of my sisters rad mm -hmm, mm -hmm. appearances and matches where's right. where's yeah, her real yeah, yeah. because let me tell you what one of the greatest matches to ever take place was a strap match with jackie in san francisco my sister and jackie and jackie would tell you the same thing <laughs> it is they went at it. They put each other over so hard. It was it's one of the best things I've ever seen. And not again, not being a fan. Yeah, yeah. So for me to say that, it was just it was an incredible exactly. match. And it's hard to find, mm -hmm. you know, and stuff like that. It's it it kind of stinks because it is diff so much more difficult to find, you know, my sister stuff than obviously than is for Christmas. She never worked for Vince, never mm -hmm. worked for the WWE. So you know, there's yeah. a little bit more of digging involved, yeah. but. You know, I have to get with Paul and get yeah. him on that to yeah. put some stuff together for us. <laughs> well, uh, final, final question: um, What do you miss most about Daniel and, and Nancy? You, don't, you know, uh, everything seems such a stock answer, but uh, Nancy would put Daniel. What I miss most about my sister is Nancy would put Daniel to sleep, and then it would just be the two of us. You know, Chris would be out on the road somewhere or whatever, and. Maybe hanging out with Law and Order on the TV, you know, low something 
not, <laughs> non, non-watchable, you know, yeah. just in the background. And we would just start talking about anything. There could be, there's no subject off limits, no anything. And she just always had the best advice and insights on things. And I'm being 10 years apart. I always kind of took it with a grain of salt because I'm like, oh God, here she goes again. She, doesn't she just know everything? Hasn't she just <laughs> been everywhere? Yeah, she has, mm-hmm. you know, and it, and she always, she instilled in me this cautious optimism, you know, of think that everyone wants to be your friend and think everyone wants to be nice to you, but always have one eye on the door. Always, always, always be ready just in case, Mm -hmm. but have fun and enjoy life, but be ready just in case. And I've always kind of taken that the same way. And it's been great advice, um, especially with everything that's happened when you just, you know, you kind of just want to live your life quietly in the little town that I live in where people don't know, Mm, you know, yeah, yeah, people don't know um, who you are, what it is, but it's really good advice because you don't know who's genuine. You know, thankfully knowing you, coming into it, knowing how much Chris loved you, knowing how Nancy always spoke so highly of you, and and just being, especially with David, just a down-to-earth, wonderful person that you know that you can talk with about Mm -hmm. something like this on a, you know, a normal level. It wasn't something that I had to kind of be concerned about. It's Mm -hmm. other people that are like, you know, hey, I want to interview you and talk to you about this, or I want to do this for you. It's, there's always an ulterior motive Mm -hmm. with stuff like that. And, um, so that's I miss those talks with her and going to her advice for advice on like literally from what shoe to wear to who to marry. <laughs> yeah. You know, like just the whole gamut. Yeah. And with Dan, it that's that's super easy. I miss his laugh. Mm. He I was one of the few people that could really get him going and when I did get him going he just he wouldn't stop. And mm. and whenever he was done laughing, he did it in this that's why I always knew he, sadly, surprising, not surprisingly, he would have made a great wrestler uh-huh. because he would have had Chris's skill and Nancy's mic skills. Oh, right. The perfect combination. Yeah. I mean, because he would put it over, he'd laugh, and, be, and then at the end he'd go, oh, Auntie Jaja, you're hilarious. Like, like, <laughs> like he was just putting me over. Where I'm like, wait a minute, were you really laughing? Or what were you? And, like, and then I tickle him more and be like, come on, dude, what was the deal there? And he oh, Auntie Jaja. And I'm like, man, he's just picking up everything. Yeah. He gets everything. So that's what I miss. Yeah. I miss the laughs, the laughs and the hugs. And with him, you know, he would have been a teenager. That's my sweet spot with kids yeah. is when they're a teenager because, like, you know, I'm just enough of a rebel to where I'd help them get in a little trouble, but yeah. not enough yeah, to yeah. where I'd have to call a bail bondsman and right. have my sister, you know, <laughs> slap me in the face. So it's my sweet spot of being with kids, and, and I. that's the only thing I'm really angry about. Mm. If anyone could say, you know, having everything taken and, and stolen from you, what's the one thing that you're the, so mad about? And that's what I'm mad about is that I don't get to, I don't get to have that. I don't get to see what kind of an amazing person that he would have been. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sandy. You're welcome. You're welcome. It's been a pleasure. Thanks so much to Sandy Tofaloni for sharing all of the great memories about her sister, uh, Nancy. And her nephew, nephew Daniel, it's such a heavy show. I mean, uh, hard to listen to that and not have a tear in your eye, but I feel uh, a little bit of closure, and I really thank Sandy for offering her thoughts on the senseless tragedy that struck her family. And we'll never really know why Chris Benoit murdered his family, killed himself. I'd have to say um, the only bit of closure that I've gotten over the years about this, especially after talking to uh, Christopher Nowinski here on, on Talk is Jericho about concussions, I really think, I mean, it's pretty obvious that Chris was suffering from that CTE, side effects that you heard about Junior Seo getting. We talked about that and just all the football players who killed themselves and just all these horrible things that were happening to them because of the the, the tremendous head trauma that they suffered over the years of wrestling. Um, no good things came as a result of Chris doing what he did. Uh, if there's anything, it's the fact that WWE now is very stringent concussion testings. And uh, if you have a concussion, you will not be performing in the ring. I know that even Christian never worked again after getting uh, the concussions that he received. And that's for the best because left to our own devices, he'd probably still be wrestling. We are trying to stop this from 
from ever happening again. It's a very physical business that we're in, but it's very easy to watch the head shots and watch the head trauma. Look at shots uh, to the head of the chair. Those don't exist anymore. As a matter of fact, when we were having the ladder match the other day, when I threw, uh, actually I didn't throw uh, Cesaro into the spike, but we had that ladder sticking out like a bridge from the uh, from the turnbuckle, like a spike, and Cesaro was thrown into it by Del Rio. As soon as that happened, we got um, uh, told, do not do that again. No more headshots with the ladders. So um, very, very uh, cognizant and uh, uh, very careful to make sure that what happened with Chris never happens again. But still, no real idea. We'll never know. We'll never know what happened, and it's just a horrible tragedy, and I miss I miss, uh, I miss, miss them every day. I miss Chris Benoit every day of my life, i got to be honest with you. But I'm glad I got a chance to talk to Sandy. Uh, shout out to David Benoit up in Edmonton, Canada. Great guy, getting his life together uh, after the huge loss that he suffered. So... Um, Hopefully this gave you guys all a little bit of uh, of credibility of uh, sorry of, of closure in this uh, horrible subject. Chris Benoit, one of the greatest performers of all time, one of my all time favorite opponents, no doubt about that, and um, also one of the biggest tragedies in the wrestling business, the rest of the history of the business. So I'm not going to say any more. Send out your prayers to uh, to the Benoit family, to uh, Sandra, to her family, and to anybody else that may be suffering this. If you are suffering some of these effects that you heard uh, Chris was suffering. Maybe you're hearing voices in your head or maybe you're, you're, you're depressed or maybe you have some sort of issues going on with your family. Please go get checked out. Things have changed in the last nine years since this happened. There's a lot more research that have taken place, a lot more knowledge, uh, as Chris Nowinski said, a lot more of, a, of, I don't know if you ever be cured for it, but a way to treat the, these, these horrible head traumas that you may have had in the past. So watch your head if you're playing sports. If you're uh, in junior high school or high school playing football, Ball, please beware if you hit your head it is not a wimpy thing to do or a bad thing to do to, to, to take a knee and sit out for a bit and go get checked out by a doctor i can't i can't emphasize that enough so thanks to all you guys for listening and thanks for supporting this podcast and of course all the great sponsors that uh, that have given their time to help us here on talk is jericho of course that includes amazon the og uh, advertiser here on talk is jericho sponsor on talk is jericho to get on amazon just go to the podcast one.com click on the killer deals button in the top right corner of the page and hit the Talk is Jericho button. All my Amazon links are there. You can buy whatever you want on Amazon if you're in the USA, the UK, or Canada. And remember, every time you use those Talk is Jericho links, Amazon links, Amazon kicks back a small percentage to this show to help us cover production costs. No hidden fees or extra charges. And if you buy something on Amazon via Amazon, become a Talk is Jericho Amazon warrior. Take a picture of what you bought. Uh, post it on the Twitter at Talk is Jericho. I will retweet it and I will follow you. Okay. Once again, go to podcast1.com. Click on the Killer Deals button in the top right corner of the page. Then hit the Talk is Jericho button. All my great sponsors are there. DDP Yoga and the DDP Yoga Now app. Go there. DDPYoga.com slash Jericho. You get three free months of the DDP Yoga Now app. It's, it's an amazing piece of technology. I do all my DDP Yoga on there as well. Get right, got rid of those DVDs and DVD player. And don't forget uh, to try DDP Yoga and the Resurrection of Jake the Snake, the great documentary watch that as well and check out true car the fastest easiest cheapest way to buy a new car and of course if you don't already subscribe to this fine show get yourself get your ass over to itunes hit that subscribe button and go ahead leave a comment and a five-star rating while you're there we love the feedback i read all the comments and we are moving up the itunes charts it's very important people look at that and decide whether or not they want to have uh, their clients uh, on this show so give me a chance man just go up there and do it and uh, thank you so much for listening today keep listening for the 60 seconds AP News headlines coming up next. I appreciate it. It's been a heavy, heavy show today, but we're going to get it back into the groove uh, next week. I have got England's number one podcaster. All right. He's like the Adam Carolla of England. He's a great guy. He's a beat poet. He's a rapper. He's an actor. He's a comedian. He is the biggest podcaster in England. He's called Scroobius Pip. How could you not love a name like that? Scroobius Pip will be here next Wednesday to talk about uh, about everything. To talk about, he's a great, great, great guy and a, a very cool, charismatic uh, guest. I did his show, and as soon as I did it, I said, I need him on my show. Scroobius Pip, all the way from London, England, will be here uh, next Wednesday on Talk is Jericho. We'll see you then. Uh, God bless you. Be safe. Please, please be safe, guys. I love you. You can download new episodes of Talk is Jericho every Wednesday and Friday at podcast1.com. That's podcast only. Daddy, where do babies come from? Uh... 